So hello, everybody. Welcome back uh, to another webinar organized uh, from Princeton for everyone worldwide. We're very happy to have Robin Brooks with us. Hi, Robin. Hi there. Thanks for having me. Glad to have you with us. Uh, Robin is from IIF, Institute of International Finance, uh, and we will talk about emerging markets, taper tantrum redux, question mark. So the emphasis is on question mark. And before we give the floor to Robin, I would like to give some theoretical introductory remarks. And um, let me start with um, sudden stops. And we have essentially experienced in the last year sudden stops and then goes again and then sudden stops perhaps again in international capital flows. So a picture I've drawn here is essentially the capital outflows. You've seen this picture again in March 2020 since the start of the COVID crisis in January. And then is it much more dramatic than in any other phases, the taper tantrum, global financial crisis, and so forth. And then they go an inflow. Of course, this is not up to date, this chart. So we saw way more inflows, and we will learn from Robin how things will play out subsequently. But what I want to emphasize here in my introductory remarks is that there are two theories of sudden stops. You can have a traditional stat focused sudden stop, or you can have a safe asset focused, a safe asset perspective. And I would like to outline this new safe asset perspective, which I've worked on a little bit, how you think about these flows in terms of a safe asset perspective, where each country has its own local safe asset, and then there's also a global safe asset uh, from a global perspective. But before we do that, let's go to the traditional perspective of sudden stops, where essentially it's a multiple equilibrium a feature of, of debt, especially if debt is in, denominated in foreign currency. There's a good equilibrium. The interest rate is low in this good equilibrium. Because the interest rate is low, it's easy to roll over your short-term debt. And hence, the default probability is low. That justifies why the investors only charge a low interest rate. That's a good equilibrium. And then there's a bad equilibrium where the interest rate is high. And because the interest rate is high, the default probability will be high if some shock comes and you would default on that. And then you might have some uh, restructuring costs going on. And that justifies then the high interest rate in the first place. And both equilibria can exist in certain circumstances. And you might have a jump from the good equilibrium to the bad equilibrium. And this jump then is uh, dramatically changing things and reevaluates your currency, especially if your debt is denominated in foreign currency, then it appreciates in, in value as well your debt. And that hurts you even further. So that's a traditional view of uh, a sudden stops. Now, let me contrast this with a safe asset perspective. And of course, we have to uh, first understand what a safe asset is and the, the thinking behind it. So it's summarized in these papers, um, which I just mentioned here. It's like you lose your local safe asset status. So you have domestically, you own government debt, it has some safe asset status and it, you lose it suddenly, and then everybody's rushing into the US Treasury to use the global safe asset as the primary safe asset to insure yourself against idiosyncratic risk. So from this perspective, typically the way you want to view asset prices is traditionally we always say an asset price is just expected present value of future cash flows, dividends, interest payments, and so forth. But you also get the service flow, and the service flow is very important to understand. So what's the service flow? It might be this asset is very good as a collateral and, and relaxes your collateral constraints. So that's a service flow a particular asset gives you on top of the cash flows. So this relaxation of the collateral, that's you know, like a Lagrange multiplier. But here, what I would like to emphasize is that a safe asset allows you to retrade. So you might face some idiosyncratic shocks. Your washing machine breaks down, your car breaks down, you need some funds. And you can then use this safe asset and sell it and get funds to you know, buy a new washing machine and somebody else gets a positive shock and we can insure each other even though markets are incomplete. So we might not be able to, to trade uh, contingencies on a washing machine breaking down, but the safe asset we can use as a precautionary savings tool. And that's a service flow through retrading, you get the service flow and hence the issuer of the this, of this safe asset doesn't have to pay you so much cash flow because you get the service flow anyway. Okay, and then, of course, money is a particular safe asset, a very attractive safe asset. And that's the exorbitant privilege that the issue of a safe asset, he essentially offers the service flow and doesn't have to pay so much in this cash flow. 
problem with the safe asset is it is fragile. It's like a bubble. It can burst. So typically, it exists very much when the interest rate is below the growth rate of the economy, but it's very fragile. And also, there's another equilibrium. You might jump, and suddenly, the safe asset status is lost. And a sudden stop from this perspective is more like a loss of a safe, a safe asset status. And let me illustrate this uh, safe asset retrading feature. Again, so it's very important that you have a safe asset which has low bid ask spreads, you can easily retrade it. And here's a very simple stylized uh, schematic perspective. You have two, uh, Mr. A and Mrs. B, for example. There's a safe asset which has zero cash flows. And both in the portfolio have the safe asset and some other asset which pays some cash flow CF, the blue one. And the white one is the safe asset, doesn't pay any cash flow. And A and B have portfolio 50 50 for simplicity. Then there's in the upstate, what happens is that the Mr. A's cash flow asset is actually getting a positive shock, and Mrs. B cash flow asset gets a negative shock. That's negatively correlated uh, just to make it idiosyncratic risk. So Mrs. B suddenly her car broke down, or whatever the safe, this other asset is, or what uh, could be a physical, you know, her. Um, operating, she operates some little business or whatever it is. Uh, but she also holds some uh, safe asset. And in the downstate, it's the other way around. Mr. A will suffer negative cash flow while Mrs. B gets a positive cash flow. So if this asset, the safe asset, this white one, has some value, what they can do in times when it goes up, they can actually retrade. So for example, in the upstate, A is buying from Mrs. B some safe asset in return to the cash flow um, asset swapping the other way. And in the downside, the swap is the other way. Okay, and this way, both A and B can insure each other, even though you cannot directly take contingent claims. And that's why people would like to hold a safe asset, even though it doesn't pay any cash flow ex ante. It's valuable because it allows through retrading, it allows to complete the markets. It allows essentially to insure each other A and B. So that's where the value of a safe asset comes from. It's purely a service flow and yields this additional service on top of cash flows because this asset has no cash flow value at all. The fundamental value will be zero. All its value is driven from this retrading. But it's very important that you can easily retrade uh, this safe asset. Now, that's what that's, you know, if, if this asset is worthless, if it has a value of zero, that's another equilibrium, then, you know, this retrading wouldn't do anything because it, you would retrade a price of zero, nobody would swap a cash flow asset in return for that. Now, let's go back to this and let's say, can you lose the safe asset status? It's a, let's say a local government bond and how do you maintain the government with this status? What's important is that R is smaller than G. So the, the rate of interest is smaller than the growth rate. And of course, there can be a little bit of risk on it. If there's aggregate risk on it, uh, then it's a risk-free rate plus a risk premium. In advanced economies, typically the, the safe asset is appreciating in times of crisis. Why? Because when you go in a recession, it is incredible risk goes up. So the safety component, the service flow component becomes more important and it gains in value. So it has a negative beta, negative cap M beta, so it appreciates in bad times and goes down in good times. So it's a little bit like gold. The US Treasury has this feature. So the risk premium is actually negative. And that makes it very easy for the US to satisfy that it's R smaller than G because the risk premium is negative for the US and other advanced economies like Germany and Japan. But for emerging markets, uh, the risk premium is actually going the other way around. They typically might lose safe asset status. So that risk premium is positive. So in bad times, you lose the safety status, the local safety status, and then you have a positive risk premium. And that makes it harder to satisfy this inequality in the first place. And when you go into risk from a risk on to a risk off environment, what happens then? The price of risk goes up because people are more concerned about the risk. And the likelihood that you jump from one to the other equilibrium is also going up. So the risk itself is going up as well. So the price of risk is going up. And the risk itself is going up for the emerging economy to lose the safe asset status. Hence, the risk premium is going up. And that means it makes it harder to satisfy this bubble condition, which you need for the safe asset status. Now, that's one thing. So you have one channel 
where you lose the safe asset status if you move from a risk on to a risk off environment. Think of March 2020. And then through the Fed interaction or reaction to that, you might be moved back to a risk on environment. Now, the other channel is really US monetary policy. It spills over dramatically to the emerging economies. So we have this bubble condition as before, but people can also use the US Treasury as a safe asset. So the local government bond is competing with uh, the US Treasury. So the interest rate on your local government debt has to be smaller than G, but it also has to be larger than the US Treasury interest rate. So you essentially like this little guy here is sandwiched. If you, you, know, you can increase the interest rate in order to satisfy that, but then you run in the danger that it becomes larger than G. So the problem with raising the interest rate is that, you know, in response of a higher monetary policy, a tightening of monetary policy in the US, or just the long-term yield going up in the US, is essentially that you have to raise the interest rate. And by raising the interest rate, you cool down your own economy. So your G goes down. So not only is this R going up, your G is going down. It makes it much more difficult to satisfy the first condition. And you have to do it in order to satisfy the second condition. And then you lose your safe asset status or the bubble burst essentially. The ideal arrangement, that's what we show in this paper, essentially is for an economy to use the local safe asset to self-insure, the citizen self-insure with respect to idiosyncratic risk. But with respect to countrywide risk, you would like to use the international safe asset, the US Treasury, for example. So that would be the ideal arrangement. But when this thing gets out of whack, citizens get become cold feet and they use the US Treasury also to ensure the idiosyncratic risk. And that's when you lose your local safe asset status and have wild swings. Of course, in anticipation of that, the risk premium is already going up and this might be very much self-fulfilling. And that's why you have the self-fulfilling sudden stops occurring in this safe asset perspective. So it's very different from the traditional thing. There's no default aspects to it. It's more like losing the safe asset status. And that gives you a rich dynamics and of course, there are many more things to say. How should you manage your reserves? What's the role of reserves? What's the role of FX interventions? So there are many aspects you can say in this framework. I won't have time to go into this, uh, but perhaps Robin will you know, explain what's really happened in the recent uh, weeks and so forth. So let me now go to Robin's poll questions. And uh, he asked, how high will the 10-year treasury yield go by the end of the year? Will it be roughly the same uh, than it is today by the end of 2021? Will it be a bit higher than 2% or will it be even above 2.5%? And the answers were it will be roughly the same as today, 20% thought, um, around 2%, 55% majority thought that, and it will be 2.5 or even higher, 25% thought gave the answer to that. And the other is, will we see a repeat of the taper tantrum, which we saw in 2013? For the emerging economies and yes 42 percent thought and no 58 percent thought so quite a different uh, so the people in the majority is not so concerned of course 48 percent it's almost 50 50. and finally the final question was what should the emerging markets do uh, when they're hit like in 2013 should they let the currency just fall and exchange rate adjust that's 51 percent think that's the right thing to do or should they just uh, intervene and hike their own interest rates to defend the currency? 25% think this way. And finally, to impose capital control to lock essentially uh, the funds in into the country, don't let them out. Uh, that's what 24% think. Okay, so with this, I pause on the floor to, to Robin, who will enlighten us what happened and uh, how can we get a glimpse how the future will play out in the emerging markets. Thanks again, Robin. It's great to have you. In this. Thanks a lot, Marcus. I really appreciate the kind of invitation. Um, and I should, uh, before I start speaking, uh, just note that I'm speaking in a personal capacity. So what I'm about to say isn't uh, reflective of official IIF views or our members. Um, the IIF is, uh, for those of you that don't know, is a trade association in Washington, DC. We have about 450 uh global member institutions uh all of whom are basically in global finance so we have all the big banks that you would know by name 
Uh, we have uh, asset managers, we have hedge funds that are mem members, we have insurers, uh, we have official institutions that are members and multilateral agencies. So we really run the gamut um, in terms of the global financial system. And uh, the origin of the IIF was in uh, the 80s when uh, a number of banks whose names you may not recognize, like Manufacturers Hanover or Chemical Bank, were getting together and realized that there was a need to figure out what their loan exposure and bond holding exposure was to emerging markets. So the genesis of the IIF in many respects is with capital flows to emerging markets. Um, and so what began in the 80s was a very, very granular and kind of forensic accounting of flows and the financial account of the balance of payments. And that's really morphed into today where I think we are um, one of the uh, providers of representative flows uh, to emerging markets at very high frequency. And, and what I mean by that is we spend a lot of time back testing our flows and making sure that they at high frequency match the balance of payments data that are published with a big lag. And, and so we're confident that, that that is the case. So we, we, we believe that we are really a good real-time gauge of flows. And, you know, um, the safe asset uh, view that Marcus outlined uh, rings so true in what I will speak about a little bit later. Um, unfortunately, uh, we are seeing a number of bumps in key emerging markets. And one of the things that we see a lot uh, is dollarization. So basically households shifting from local currency into hard currency dollars in the local banking system. And that is in a way a shift to the safe asset, although it's obviously hard for many people to actually buy US treasuries. It's the banks that do that then on their behalf. So it's the, the financial system that's intermediating this. So um, I'm gonna uh, share some slides. I'll put them up on the screen now. and. Um, and then uh, look forward to any feedback, comments, and suggestions. So um, I'm going to basically talk about three things today. Um, you know, when we think about emerging markets, we think about push and pull. It goes a little bit back to the multiple equilibria story that uh, Marx was talking about at the beginning. Um, and one of the push factors is interest rates in advanced economies and most importantly, interest rates in, in the United States. So the first thing that I'm gonna talk about today is one aspect of this push factor. And I'm gonna zero in on the taper tantrum in 2013 as a possible template for what we are seeing today. Uh, yields, as you all know, have risen significantly in the United States. Um, they may rise a lot more. Uh, the majority of the opinion in the poll that Marcus did was that they will rise only a little bit. Uh, so they will only go from currently around 1.7 to 2%. Um, I think that's a good reflection of the market consensus actually, Marcus. I think the, the market basically is of the view that we are seeing a little bit of a rise, but it's not earth shattering. And of course, that then correlates with the second view uh, in the survey that emerging markets, 60, 40% of the opinion think emerging markets will be fine. There will not be a repeat of the paper tantrum because the rise in US rates is, is contained. And of course, the question is, is that view correct? So I'm gonna go through uh, the history of the 2013 taper tantrum. I'm then going to talk about the history of emerging market flows where I'm not just going to talk about uh, 2013 We've seen a number of shocks to EM, most recently, obviously, the COVID shock in, in, in last year. Um, and these, the history matters for how people see emerging markets, how they're willing to invest. I think behavioral economics and behavioral finance are very important for actual decision making. And so I just want to uh, talk a little bit about that. And then I will talk specifically about the initial conditions 
today, 2021 versus 2013, as we head into this higher rate environment, potentially. If there is one chart, I think, that helps understand what is going on in terms of rising yields and contrasting with 2013, I think it's the one that I've put up on this slide here. So I'm showing three lines. It is the two-year yield. So this is the yield, you can basically think of it as the Treasury yield, I'm using swap rates here, but you can use them interchangeably. Um, uh, I'm then showing the 10 year yield. So that is basically the Treasury yield that we just talked about. It's currently around 1.7%. And then I'm using a proxy for longer dated yields, the 10 year, 10 year forward interest rates. So that is if you have a 20 year bond and you have a 10 year bond, it's the second segment, it's the 10 year interest rate uh, segment. Um, that I can back out from those two yields. And uh, what this chart shows you is one important lesson from 2013. The taper tantrum in 2013 was not really about front end yields, short dated interest rates. It was about longer dated interest rates. It was about the 10 year interest rate and it was about 10 year, 10 year forward. So it is about term premia, about risk premia. It's not really about, is the Fed gonna hike next year? Is it gonna hike in 2023? That's kind of a side note to this discussion. You can see that the two-year yield did rise a little bit in 2013. So markets as part of the taper tantrum did become a little bit more hawkish on the Fed. They started pricing in interest rate hikes from the Fed, which the Fed, uh, like today, had said it will not do on any foreseeable horizon. But in the scheme of things, this was a uh, small fry. And um, you can see that the black line today is starting to inch up a little bit again. Markets on the front end are again pricing some tightening. Um, but the big story is again in longer dated yields. And so this is a big parallel between 2013 and today. We're, we're really discussing term premia, risk premia, the drivers of the longer end of the yield curve. We're not really discussing uh, the short-term behavior of the Fed. And for example, things like, I hear a lot of commentary on how what's going on in the yield curve, questions, Fed forward guidance, average inflation targeting. I don't really think that's what's going on. Um, so let me go into the comparison of um, the, uh, what's happening today in the yield curve with 2013 and the taper tantrum. And I want to focus all of your attention on the left chart, which basically goes through the four way stations of the taper tantrum. Um, the taper tantrum began in 2013 on May 22nd when then chair Ben Bernanke um, floated the idea of adjusting the volume, the monthly volume of purchases under the QE3 program back then um, in his congressional testimony. And this, this was a shock to markets. Markets were not prepared for this. Um, and you can see after that first arrow that I've put in there, the 10-year yield did rise. We had a move roughly from 2% uh, to two and a quarter. So we, we basically went up a little bit and emerging market currencies started coming under pressure. The real turning point in 2013 was then the June 19th FOMC meeting. This ended up being a huge shock to markets and it was a big hawkish surprise. Markets basically came into that meeting thinking that the Fed would calm things down, that Ben Bernanke would be dovish, that the rise in yields would be something that the Fed would lean on, and therefore um, this would be good for risk assets, for risk appetite, and so forth. The opposite happened. Ben Bernanke in that press conference basically said, we are going to lay out a timetable for tapering later on this year, assuming that our forecasts are met. And um, so we will, um, we will go ahead. The press conference was then again and again, the question, well, are you fine with rising longer term yields? 
And his answer to that, and I'm going to come back to that, to this, uh, was yes, we're fine with it. Um, after this, the 10-year yield shot up. So it was a, this was a huge event for markets. It was a huge hawkish surprise. And emerging market currencies really took a big hit. I'll, I'll show some of those charts uh, later on in the presentation. We go through the summer. Uh, at the same time, there was a lot of speculation building in the course of that summer about the succession to Ben Bernanke, whose term was uh, running down. Uh, at some point that summer, there was a lot of speculation that Larry Summers would be his successor. And at the time, um, Summers was seen as a hawk. So this added fuel to the fire uh, in the taper tantrum. And you can see that by the end of August, yield on 10-year treasury was around 3%. So we'd done basically a move in two, three months from 1.6% to 3%. This is the taper tantrum. Now, the end of the taper tantrum was the September FOMC meeting. And basically the September FOMC meeting was the opposite of the June FOMC meeting. In June, uh, Ben Bernanke, the Fed chair said, yeah, we're not worried by the rise in rates. Financial conditions are still very accommodative. In September, the message was the opposite. It was rates have risen a lot. We're worried about financial conditions. And in particular, we're worried how much financial conditions may tighten going forward. And as a result, the Fed, even though markets came into that September meeting almost universally expecting tapering to start, the Fed did not taper at that meeting. It was a huge dovish surprise. I remember people uh, on, on the trading floor at Goldman, where I worked at the time, just being shocked that this didn't happen. And that really ended the episode. It was a very big dovish surprise. After that, you can see yields basically were contained. The Fed then did taper at the end of 2013 in the December meeting, but it was basically a non-event. The, the sting had basically been removed from uh, this fear of higher interest rates via this big dovish surprise. So this is really a story about uh, a, an overshoot, if you will. Um, and when I, when I tell this story, um, the pushback that I get from people is, well, this is completely different from today. We know the Fed is super dovish today. And this was a change in the reaction function of the Fed. This was a hawkish shift. All else equal, fundamentals being what they are, the Fed just became more hawkish, most obviously in the June meeting. And I don't really think that's what was going on at the time. So take the June FOMC press conference Ben Bernanke was asked again and again, are you fine with rising yields? And his answer to that question was, yes, I'm fine with it because fundamentals are improving. Growth fundamentals are improving. We're becoming more optimistic on the growth outlook for the United States. If you remember at the time, fiscal policy was contractionary. Uh, fiscal was subtracting about one, one and a half percent from GDP growth in 2013. Fed had a view that that uh, negative impulse to the economy would fade. And they were pleased that the economy was still, in spite of that negative impulse, growing quite strong. So it was an upbeat view from the Fed. It was, in other words, a positive impression of data. And in the right chart on the slide, I'm showing you a simple visualization, an imperfect one, but a visualization of this data element that was happening at the time. So the blue line is again, the 10 year yield, same as in the left chart. The black line is a data surprise index. So this is quite literally, you go to Bloomberg, you look at what is the data outturn uh, on a particular release. So for example, tomorrow we're gonna get non-farm payrolls, which is by far the most important data release for the United States. Uh, Bloomberg always shows you the consensus, the median expectation across, across all the people uh, making forecasts for this data release. And so here I'm showing across all the uh, data releases that come out for the United States, a simple weighted average of these data surprises in their historical standard deviation. And so when that is positive, 
it's on balance, positive surprises. I'm showing here a 60 day moving average. If it's negative, then it is on balance a negative surprise over that 60 day window. And what you will see is that early 2013 was quite a weak uh, period for data, but right in, in the run up to that June meeting, data started uh, surprising quite positively and it underpinned that view from the Fed that the economy is doing quite well and can withstand higher yields. That's, a, that's an important parallel with today. So that's why on the previous slide, I made the distinction uh, on this picture between taper tantrum and data tantrum. Or what I think we're gonna have now is data tantrum, but really the two aren't that different. And uh, in the end, central banks are data dependent and this is an important parallel. So in 2013, what was going on in financial markets? How were financial markets digesting this episode? And here I'm using this data surprise index to try and shed a little bit of light on how markets were trading longer term yields. So what I'm doing here is I'm running a very simple regression. Uh, I'm running on the left-hand side, the 10 daily change in the 10 year yield. Uh, and I'm regressing that on the data surprise every day. Uh, I'm regressing it on the changes in Euro periphery yields. This is on the tail end of the European sovereign debt crisis. You will remember Mario Draghi in the middle of 2012 had said, he will do whatever it takes to keep the Euro together. And on the tail end of that statement, Euro periphery spreads were still uh, coming down. So that was a force for uh, longer term treasury yields to go up, the safe haven demand out of Europe for, for US treasuries. So back to what uh, Marcus was saying at the beginning was diminishing. And then I'm also controlling for another global risk appetite proxy, which is the, the VIX, uh, which is uh, uh, forward looking equity vol for the S&P 500. So the left chart here shows you over time, and I'm doing rolling regressions uh, on a three month rolling window. 60 day rolling window for trading days. It shows you the total explanatory power of these three factors, so data surprises, periphery yields, and the VIX um, over time. That's the black line. And you can see that, generally speaking, this R squared over that time horizon diminished. That's mainly because Euro periphery sovereign yields became less important as a driver of 10 year treasury yields. And that intuitively makes sense because at the end of the day, at some point, that yield compression channel was gonna be exhausted. And so, so that's basically what uh, this regression shows. The, the thing that I wanna emphasize here is the partial explanatory power from US data surprises. And so I'm showing you here in black, the overall R squared of these rolling regressions and in blue, the partial R squared from data surprises only. And you can see that in the middle of 2013, the explanatory power of data start becoming much more important. Markets all of a sudden realize, holy cow, the Fed actually is very data dependent and data will influence uh, what is going on with longer term yields, right? This is not a regression that makes any statement on forward guidance or front end yields. The left hand side variable is the 10 year yield, right? So this is different. It's not so map it into today, it's not going to be a statement about average inflation targeting and Fed forward guidance. This is about longer term yields. And so markets realized correctly at the time that the Fed was paying close attention to data. I, in the right chart, allow positive data surprises and negative data surprises to have their own coefficients. So I'm allowing for this regression to see what kind of data matter more? Is it positive data surprises or negative data surprises? And intuitively, again, you can see that the, the T statistic, which is a measure of the statistical significance of these surprises for positive data surprises starts to become really, really important statistically speaking. It goes beyond the plus two, minus two, um, band, which denotes statistic, statistical significance in the middle of 2013. So again, markets are becoming very data focused. 
and they know that it's positive data that are going to change the Fed stance, so they become disproportionately focused on positive data surprises. Why does all of this matter for today, and what is the parallel? We are in the process of vaccinating like crazy. Hopefully soon we will be able to resume business as normal. The economy will be reopening. Uh, I would say the consensus expectation for GDP growth in the second and third quarters is around 10% quarter over quarter annualized. We will see very strong beta in the coming quarters. And so there is a direct parallel to this taper tantrum data tank and distinction and the data side of things will be very powerful as we now go forward and markets are starting to listen. The same thing that played out in 2013 is playing out now. We're seeing a similar rise in the data dependence of moves in the 10-year treasury yield. So what can the Fed do? What can the Fed do to maybe take on board the lessons from 2013 to maybe do things differently? And I I just want to offer a characterization of what is happening to longer term yields um, and do a little bit of a disaggregation of the move in yields into inflation break evens. I show those on the left chart and then real interest rates, the residual basically between the nominal interest rate and the inflation break even so Robin, the right side. And question? in black, I'm showing here the US five year, five year forward in the left chart, inflation break even, and in the right chart, the real five-year, five-year forward interest rate. Uh, blue is the equivalent for uh, the Eurozone, and um, red is uh, Japan. Um, and the defining characteristic of this bond market sell-off that we've seen so far this year is that it hasn't been driven by break-even inflation. So you'll recall um, people like Larry Summers and Olivier Blanchard have been having debate on overheating uh, and perhaps the amount of fiscal stimulus being excessive. And many people are pushing back to say, well, inflation break-evens aren't rising rapidly. So why are you worrying about overheating risks at the moment? And I think that's a good point, but it misses an important dynamic in the market that's happening at the moment, which is that inflation break-evens are basically well-behaved and pretty stable because real interest rates are rising so rapidly. So what's happening is markets are tightening longer dated real financial conditions by pushing real interest rates up. And obviously this tightening in financial conditions that's happening is keeping longer dated inflation break even. So what the market is pricing for longer dated inflation uh, relatively well behaved. So the overheating discussion that is taking place should really be focused on the move in real rates and whether much as in 2013, we get an undesirable overshooting of real interest rates. Could that happen? Um, so Robin can ask a question. Yeah. So Laura would like to know, when you look at Bloomberg service about the future rate behavior, does it make a big difference whether you anticipate a rate hike down the road by the Fed, very smooth or later on like a hockey stick, no rate hike for quite a while and then a sharp rise? Where would you see it in, in your, would there be any way to look out for, for certain yield curve features or? So I think it's a key, that is a key question and it's a great question um, because it comes to, I have to be careful I don't go off on a 20 minute tangent here because I, I love the question, but um, uh, I think what we have to manage uh, in the policy setting generally is how dovish are we at the front end versus the back end? Mm -hmm. So how do we manage front end interest rates to make sure that real interest rates at the back end don't move too much and produce an undesired tightening in financial conditions. And we all know that for GDP growth and for financial conditions, which drive GDP growth, it's, it's longer dated yields that matters, right? Just think of the mortgage market, the housing market in the United States, the 10-year yield is what matters. It's not the Fed funds future 
two years out or even the Fed funds target. So I think the underlying discussion that we are all having and the debate basically from 2013 is whether we should be a little bit more hawkish preemptively potentially at the front end to manage a rate move at the back end. Um, and, and so I think what you want to avoid is, um, you know, for example, in coming weeks, very strong data for the second quarter, for the third quarter coming in, and for real interest rates in the back end to shoot up, and for us to then have to do a dovish surprise again into the September 2013 FOMC meeting to try and get things under control. Um, so what can the Fed do to manage longer dated yields? So I have a suggestion for a simple thing, low-hanging fruit. Uh, Marcus, you may be familiar with a puzzle in finance, which is that inflation break-evens, longer dated inflation break-evens, so for example, five-year, five-year, four-year forward, are highly correlated with spot oil prices. So when the, the spot oil price goes up, for some reason, inflation six to 10 years out, break-even inflation goes up. Makes no sense. <laughs> economically speaking, because that's so far down the road, it's not obvious what uh, a move in oil prices to do uh, has anything to do on, on that horizon. And there is a simple direct analogy from what's happening in these five-year, five-year real interest rates now in anticipation of this Q2 and Q3 rebound in GDP. We're basically seeing a move in spot activity should that be influencing real interest rates on a five-year, five-year forward horizon? It's not obvious to me at all. And I think the lowest hanging fruit for the Fed is to make that distinction clear. And for uh, senior Fed officials in the press conference to say, okay, we are looking at a strong GDP rebound, but really it's just payback for a pretty miserable 2020. It says nothing about longer term trend growth, potential growth, et cetera. That remains to be seen. And so everyone needs to take a chill pill. That would be my preferred message. Um, and it would be a very mild form of verbal intervention in longer term treasury yields. The most extreme form of verbal intervention would then be YCC, which I, I don't think is a great idea for the US. Um, so, with that said, um, and again, the consensus in your survey says that the yield move will be contained, right? So it's a, it's a fairly benign outlook uh, for markets. So with all of that said- market economies, you would say it's mostly the 10 year which matters rather than the short term. Yes, absolutely. And in okay, fact, so um, my preferred metric for, uh, what is going on in the bond market is the 10-year, 10-year forward. I think it's the best comparator over time. Why? Because forward guidance has evolved over time and average inflation targeting is a more powerful form of forward guidance than we used to have uh, in the run-up to 2013. Um, and so the 10-year yield, of course, depends to a large degree on front-end interest rates. So it's still being held down and managed by that forward guidance. So if you want a cleaner comparison of upward pressure on the yield curve, better to look at something like five-year, five-year forward or 10-year, 10-year forward. So uh, my preferred measure is really the 10-year, 10-year forward. What I forgot to say when I showed this chart was if you just look at the move in 10-year, 10-year forward since the Georgia Senate runoff election on January 5th of this year, so that was when the Dems unexpectedly won both seats and it sort of was uh, solidified views in the market that we have a blue wave and we have more fiscal expansion. Since then, 10 year, 10 year forward has risen about 80 basis points. That's the same move as we had during the taper tantrum. So based on the Delta, we're similar. Okay, um, so flows. So we, we would like to, if you can also contrast it with the March 2020 and the rebound at the same time, uh, not only 2013 and 2000, what's going 21, but perhaps 2020 as well. Yes, perfect. Um, 
the last thing I, I, sh I should say on that, on interest rates. So we are about to get, and thanks for the reminder, Marcus, uh, we are about to get opening data. Um, that's hugely important. Um, why? Because you know, everybody on Wall Street who makes forecasts basically works within the historical distribution. And what we saw last year when we shut down the economy was completely beyond anything we had seen in the historical distribution. Um, the historical standard deviation of non-farm payrolls misses relative to consensus, for example, is around 80,000 uh, jobs. We had misses that were 117 standard deviations. So we were completely off the charts and history was no guide. We are going to do that now in reverse order. We are reopening the economy. The historical distribution is going to be very little guide. To give you an idea, tomorrow, the consensus expectation for non-farm payrolls is 650,000 jobs added. Um, so the, that's a pretty robust number in 2013. Uh, to give you an idea, non-farm payrolls ran on average around 200,000. But really the uh, whisper number, which is a sort of Wall Street slang for the inside number is around 1 million. So there's a huge margin of error around what the data are going to be in coming months. And that is why I think it's so important coming back to Fed communication for the Fed to manage this disconnect between five year, five year forward rates and what's going on in this very short, short near term, which again says nothing about uh, longer term growth outlook with, by the way, a very uh, a, a significantly higher debt burden. Um, so flows. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, what happened in 2020 and contrast it with now a little bit. So we are, I think, the, the best resource for flows at high frequency for emerging markets. Um, and you can see here our high frequency flows. We cover on a daily basis 14 emerging markets. And uh, those include the key emerging markets that we all think of, Brazil, Turkey, South Africa, um, Colombia, Chile, um, all the uh, India, all the key countries that you care about, and China. And if I include China, the left chart shows you that um, we had this terrible drawdown in flows. Um, I have a whole team that uh, looks at the data that we pull in uh, from exchanges and emerging markets and from web scraping. And actually, at the height of the COVID shock, um, in March last year, I was convinced our data were broken. And we had long discussions internally in the middle of the night uh, about some of the data that were coming in because they were so negative. So think back to what I was just saying about non-farm payroll and, and those surprises being completely off the map. The flows that we got at that time were completely off the map too. The, rebound that we then had in the course of the year for emerging market flows was quite weak um, until we got news of vaccines in November. Uh, and after that, we had a pretty big rebound in the fourth quarter. But the important thing in the left chart, which includes China flows, and in the right chart, which excludes China, because it's kind of a separate thing, I'll talk about that quickly uh, in a second, is that as yields have now risen this year, flows to emerging markets have, have gone negative. Okay, so, so we have basically seen this push factor, this level of yields in the United States, um, really weigh on flows to emerging markets. Let me skip this next slide and jump um, straight to a comparison with the global financial crisis, just to put what happened last year in perspective. Now, flows were very large out of emerging markets at the height of the COVID shock. But of course, you have to scale somehow, right? Uh, we've had a decade of super low interest rates in the advanced world. We've therefore had lots of money that got pushed to emerging markets. So we have to scale 
by the underlying stock of foreign holdings if we wanna make comparisons across episodes. And so what I do here is I take all the data that we have on flows and I look at the COVID shock in Q1 and Q2 2020, that's the left chart. And I compare it with Q3 and Q4 in 2008, that's the right chart. I scale both things by the stock of foreign holdings before the shock. Okay, so we take data from the international investment position of each country, which gives you the holdings that foreign investors have in these countries, and you can therefore use it to scale the underlying position and make these uh, make a comparison across these very different episodes. And so what you can see is that in aggregate, and I have here on the horizontal axis, emerging markets excluding China, that is a bar. I have in aggregate an outflow of 1% of the underlying asset position in 2020. So that's the magnitude of the COVID shock across all non-China emerging markets. So that's the little red bar that's slightly negative. That's the flow. The blue bar is the valuation and together those are the change due to the COVID shock in the international investment position, the liability to foreigners. The comparable figure in 2008 is um, 4%. Uh, so the red bar, the flow was, the outflow at the time was 4% of the underlying holdings that investors had. In other words, the COVID shock while in dollar absolute terms looked terrible, it was actually much smaller relative to the underlying position. It was about a quarter of the size of the global financial crisis. Marcus, how much time do we have left? Uh, we can go a little bit longer so that I know that we probably okay. have another 15 minutes. Okay, perfect. Um, so if we look at the difference between 2008 the global financial crisis and 2020. In aggregate, the 2020 COVID shock was less severe than 2008. But of course, people are differentiating between different countries. And so who got hit harder in 2020 versus 2008? So that's what I look at in this left chart scatter plot uh, that you can see here. And this is basically foreign portfolio flows in Q1 and Q2, again, scaled by the pre-existing asset position. Um, when this number is negative, it denotes selling. So this is the reduction in the foreign invest international investment position due to selling in uh, uh, EM stocks and bonds. And on the vertical axis, you have the same thing for um, the 2008 shock for Q3 and Q4 2008. If you are above the diagonal and to the left, then in 2020, you are hit harder. There is more selling during the COVID shock than in the global financial crisis. You will see that for most emerging markets, the hit is less. So that's consistent with this high level statistic that 2020 is less severe for emerging markets than the uh, COVID shock. But there were three exceptions. Brazil got hit harder during the COVID shock. Uh, that's BR. Poland got hit harder during the COVID shock and Turkey. Turkey got hit hardest by far. And so this is kind of a sad footnote to uh, some of the developments recently in financial markets that have been happening where Turkish Lira is under pressure again now. Um, 2020 was already a very difficult year for Turkey with foreign investors selling Turkey above any other emerging markets when we scale by the size of the underlying position. And so really the setup to some of the depreciation pressure that's now manifesting itself on the Turkish lira is, is in a setting uh, that already in 2020 was quite negative. We can do the same kind of scaling exercise for 2013. That was the taper tantrum. You can see that at the time, the red bars for many, many emerging markets in the left chart. So here I'm looking at the second and the third quarters in 2013 are actually positive. So we didn't see outflows the way we saw during the global financial crisis 
and um, during the COVID shock. Um, that's an important point because you can have large exchange rate devaluations even though flows don't go negative. Why? Because of course, countries have large current account deficits. They have large funding needs. And so even if the flow remains positive, but it gets significantly weaker, that can cause an exchange rate devaluation. We had an EM shock in 2015 when the RMB devalued, that's the right chart here in this chart. We're getting more outflows now in percent of the underlying asset position. We had another EM shock in 2018, um, which largely was due to Argentina and Turkey and contagion to other emerging markets. Again, we had selling to other emerging markets. You put all these shocks together in the right chart on this slide, and I'm showing in pink the global financial crisis, outflows in percent of the underlying asset position, uh, in green the taper tantrum, in orange the RMB devaluation episode, the EM sell-off in 2018 in blue, and then the COVID shock in red. And you can see that there is kind of a bifurcation in emerging markets. Turkey, Poland, THS, Thailand, India, some of these big emerging markets pretty consistently get hit hard when these shocks flows uh, become negative, foreign investors sell. But there's a big exception, China. China continues to get positive inflows during many of these shocks. The only exception is 2015. And then there are some uh, commodity heavy emerging markets like Colombia and Chile who basically export to China who also consistently do well in these shocks and continue to get inflows. So, so Robin, uh, Mark Sobel would like to know whether we put too much emphasis on the US common global financial cycle, uh, global financial cycle driver and is idiosyncratic, can you, why do certain countries, emerging markets do much better than other emerging markets? Do you have a thought on that? As you just said, you know, Poland yep. and... Yep, great question. So I think the reality is that the, um, the beta, the push factor is hugely important. Um, so let's say that uh, the survey uh, that we did at the beginning of this talk is wrong. Um, it's highly unlikely because of the esteemed audience, but let's say we're all surprised and treasury yields go in short order up to three or 4%. It would be a massive shock. Uh, this will swamp any idiosyncratic characteristics. If instead we have a contained and a benign move in the 10 year yield up to 2%, as is the base case in the survey, then I do think the idiosyncratic characteristics matter. Um, and it matters how well countries um, are seen by investors. And I think that's sort of the position we are in right now. Um, and I think it really matters that you have a central bank that is seen as orthodox, which plays by the rules of international finance, meaning if your currency comes under pressure for whatever reason, uh, the central bank is willing to tighten, in particular, if that um, depreciation is a threat to the inflation outlook. And I think the transparency and consistency of policymaking are also something that really matters. And you will note in this chart, so this chart is a great example of idiosyncratic differentiation across emerging markets, because China is an idiosyncratic story for many reasons. Uh, it's very large, it has consistent high GDP growth, and as I'll discuss in a second, people are underinvested in China. But Chile and Colombia are not necessarily countries that you would uh, off the top of your hat put at the top of the list. And, but both have very good governance, conservative central bank and consistent policy making. And so besides their commodity exposure to China, it's definitely seen as a big positive in financial markets and you can see that in the close. So how important are reserve holdings in this context besides governance issues? The Sorry, I didn't. The holdings of these countries, are they very important too in differentiating across countries? Yes, I think they, I think they matter as well. Um, yes, I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part of the question, the reserve holdings? The, the reserve holdings are oh, very the, the reserve important has, to this absolutely. So, across the emerging markets countries. So broadly speaking, uh, the level of reserves has, for some of the key emerging markets, has doubled 
been the course of the last decade. So since 2013. So, you know, to give you some numbers, India in the run up to 2013 had reserves of 260 billion. We're easily double that. We're 550. We're almost 600 billion now. That picture holds for many emerging markets. Um, so the reserve coverage uh, relative to the size of the economy in many emerging markets has improved. That said, and, and I think this is the key point, during 2020, with one exception, emerging markets did not use their reserves very aggressively. In other words, you know, this sort of uh, coverage term that we have in emerging markets, fear of floating, this fear of exchange rate flexibility, it has subsided a lot. And the degree of comfort that emerging markets have with FX flexibility has gone up. That's a huge positive mm -hmm. um, in a way. And so the level of reserves, um, ironically, these days, even though it's developed very favorably, is less important. I think countries have become more comfortable allowing their exchange rates to adjust. I think that's fundamentally a very positive uh, development. The two emerging markets that intervened heavily in 2020 were Turkey and Brazil. Mm -hmm. And both of those, I think, are very much in the crosshairs of emerging markets uh, still, uh, of markets uh, still today. So, Next question by Ashoka Modi about why has India suffered so little outflows? Is there anything, any reading you have on that? I don't know whether. Uh, it's always good when you get a question from a former esteemed boss. Uh, Ashok was my boss at the IMF. So Ashok, I will come back to your question. I have a chart on exactly this in, okay. in one second. I hope you're good. Um, so pre-existing conditions coming into um, 20, 21 versus 2013. I'm just going to give two perspectives. Um, and then I'm going to talk about caveats. I think your survey, Marcus, at the beginning, 60% thought we will not get a repeat of the taper tantrum, 40% thought we would. It's a good reflection of consensus, as I said. And the reason are these two charts. Um, the left chart shows you the size of portfolio inflows in the run up to 2021. So I'm taking three years of 2018 to 2020 in percent of GDP. So that's basically the, the wall of money that's been coming into emerging markets recently. And I compare that on the vertical axis with the wall of money coming into 2010, uh, from 2010 to 2012. And the key thing in the key differentiating factor today versus back then is this is, the recovery sort of on speed. Back then we had 2010, we had QE2, we had Operation Twist. Uh, so yields were kept low for quite a long time and emerging markets benefited from that hugely. So the wall of money to emerging markets built up very significantly over a long period. Markets now are much noisier and faster moving. The buildup in EM positioning basically has been one quarter and that was Q4 of last year on the good vaccine news. So if you look at this chart, most of the emerging markets are way above the diagonal, meaning in the run up to the taper tantrum, buying by financial markets of emerging markets was much more intense in the run up to the taper tantrum. So that's good. There's been less hot money going into emerging markets, if you will. You get the same perspective if you look at the change in real exchange rates. So the, the real appreciation that uh, emerging markets experience. So again, I'm doing the same comparison, the change in real exchange rate 2018 to 2020 on the horizontal axis versus the change in the real exchange rate 2010 to 2012 on the vertical axis. Many emerging markets are above the diagonal and to the left. So for example, Brazil has actually weakened very significantly over the last three years. Turkey, same thing. That's not to say that these levels are fine. It's a much more complicated question because of course fundamentals have evolved too. So this is really a fair value question, but generally speaking, it's consistent with the pattern that inflows have been less. There's one important caveat I've, I've circled here, Egypt, which is EG. Egypt is an example of a quasi dollar peg. It's not officially a peg, but it looks like one. And so as the dollar has risen, 
and it's risen significantly in the last five or six years, and recently as part of the COVID shock, and now it's rising because of higher US interest rates, the Egyptian pound gets dragged with the dollar in real effective terms. So you're getting an appreciation, you're importing an appreciation because of higher US interest rates, because of a big fiscal stimulus in the United States, and your fundamentals are completely different. So this is a, an advertisement for flexible exchange rates for not pegging against the dollar and for allowing your country fundamentals to drive your exchange rate, basically. So uh, dollar pegs are a big caveat in this general less vulnerability. Two, um, two last points that I wanna make. China is a completely idiosyncratic story. Uh, I'm showing here in the left chart flows to China, which are very strong across uh, asset managers, I would say China is the preeminent destination at the moment, whereas flows to non-China emerging markets in black are quite weak. Why is there this, this dichotomy? And this goes now to Ashok's question. Um, basically, what's going on is that investment, uh, foreign investment in China has been severely curtailed for many years, and so people are underinvested. Uh, so you can see here, I'm showing in Q4 2020 in the right chart, the stock of foreign portfolio holdings in percent of GDP. For China, that's only around 17% of GDP. For India, it's even lower, it's 12% of GDP. So these markets are benefiting from a structural underinvestment. And therefore, when you have a big adverse shock to Ashok's question, you don't really want to sell the asset that you have too little of to begin with. Um, it's something where you ideally love to have a bigger position, but you're constrained. And so this disproportionately puts pressure on other emerging markets that are over, perhaps overrepresented in foreign investor holdings. So look at how big Czar is, South Africa, in terms of foreign investment. Uh, look at how big Mexico is. Um, you know, these are examples where foreign investors hold a lot of assets. Almost the last slide. So the wall of money to emerging markets has been much less than in the run-up to 2013. That's good. Current account deficits are more modest. That's also good. Real exchange rates have risen less. Um, also good. There's a big different debate, however, now on emerging market growth. And the sad reality is that emerging market growth has been struggling for many years. And this is a complete change from the run up to 2013. And it's shaping the way that investors and capital flows are going to emerging markets. So the left chart shows you a basket of emerging market currencies. This is the Fed's basket um, that's published weekly. Um, and it shows you that basket vis a vis the US dollar. This is the nominal currency index. So when this blue line is going down, it means weaker emerging market currencies vis-a-vis -vis the dollar on a, on a trade weighted nominal basis. I've highlighted in red the taper tantrum in 2013. The taper tantrum in many ways is old news compared to the shocks that followed, which were much bigger. You had a big drop in commodity prices in 2014, uh, a big drop in oil prices that was a huge negative shock for exporters like Colombia, oil exporters like Brazil. We then had this China devaluation scare in 2015. And of course we had COVID in 2020. So the succession of shocks has been very large. Emerging market currencies have fallen on balance, but growth has not rebounded. If you look at the right chart, I'm showing you growth in emerging markets on a GDP weighted basis excluding China and India. So the two big underrepresented emerging markets. And you can see we had a rebound after the global financial crisis. Growth was pretty good in the wake of um, the 2008-2009 crisis, but it has asymptoted down towards growth in advanced economies. So that's G10 growth. So actually, if you look at non-China, non-India EM, we're not getting any meaningful growth outperformance relative to the G10 at this point. And if you think about why are we investing in emerging markets? Well, foreign investors will tell you they do it for diversification, but they're also doing it for essentially yield pickup. 
uh, or the carry trade in, in whatever form you want to call it. And that really is an arbitrage of growth. And if that growth premium goes away, that is a fundamental headwind for capital flows to emerging markets. And this is really where I think the discussion on emerging markets these days is happening. And if you were to do that, that's per country GDP growth. It's not per capita. Per capita, it would look even worse, I guess. You would per say capita, the, you're right. Per capita, it, 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 it would look even worse. Now, uh, I must have done a Freudian slip because I ended the presentation two slides early, but it's fine. So let me just, in closing, there, there are underlying worries now, even though the pre-existing conditions for emerging markets are better, there are big concerns about growth. And this is where Turkey comes in, and this will be the last thing I'll say. Some countries in emerging markets are pursuing activist policy to try and get growth up. The list of those countries is foremost Argentina and Turkey. And both of those countries have as a result of these activist policies seen a lot of volatility in GDP growth, but they have not gotten GDP growth up on a consistent basis. And this really is the dilemma for emerging markets. What is the correct policy response to reinvigorate growth? And it's the, the answer is lots of boring questions like structural reforms, opening up the labor market, these kinds of boring things that people like to dismiss that frankly, we in the United States and other advanced economies also need to do. Um, but this is the underlying structural headwind for emerging markets. So headline is emerging markets are better positioned. There's this underlying growth change. So let me stop there. Great, thanks a lot. Uh, this was really a nice overview picture of what's going on in emerging economies and what the threats are. At the end, it's not so dangerous. I mean, if there is some risk involved, but I think it's, am I right that uh, there's some optimism in your slides and your presentation? Yes. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of emerging markets and I do think fundamentally the growth potential is there, right? So the economic justification for capital flows to go there is definitely given. So coming to some of the questions, I will keep it uh, shorter this time because we run longer. Uh, one was by Dana Saporta. You outlined at length the Ben Bernanke's uh, taper tantrums communication, but later on in 2017, Janet Yellen was also communicating in a much softer way. Uh, what are the lessons from 2017 of Janet Yellen's communication we can now employ uh, again? Or is there anything, uh, is the environment different so it's not so useful at this stage? So, um... You know, by so I so let me let me um, well, Laura, let me rephrase the question. Have we learned from the 2013 taper tantrum and we now have it down in terms of communication? <laughs> <laughs> so let me let me draw, let me make the key distinction in my mind between Janet Yellen and uh, Ben Bernanke, and I'm not going to make a commentary on on the people or the communication of both individuals. I think they're both awesome. Um, let me that. draw the distinction from a different perspective. When the taper tantrum happened in 2013, we were still doing QE3. We were not doing that in 2017. In fact, Janet Yellen did the first hike at the end of 2015. That is night and day. And the comparator, therefore, in terms of financial markets and their focus on the Fed, I think is very much 2013. Right now, the Fed is doing a very significant quantitative easing program. It's doing a quantitative easing program in the face of potentially very strong near-term GDP data. And so 2013, I think, is the right template for that. And in terms of the Fed communication itself, the FOMC press conference on the 17th of March, which we just had two weeks ago, the key question that Steve Leisman uh, from CNBC asked uh, Jay Powell, the Fed chair now, was, are you comfortable with the level of 10-year yields? Steve Leisman 
was also doing press conference when the taper tantrum happened. So he's, he has the benefit of having done both episodes. He asked the right question. And um, Chair Powell's response to that question was, I think financial conditions are highly accommodative and I would only be worried if market moves are disorderly. So that is code for, no, I'm not worried about the level of the 10 year yield. It can go higher as long as things don't get out of hand. What happened after that communication overnight is that the 10 year yield rose quite significantly. Um, it is what the Turkish central bank governor woke up to the next morning and made him hike interest rates more, which precipitated the events in Turkey that are unfolding now. So typically we have a tradition in this webinar series, we end up a positive note. And uh, I know that your, your outlook was quite positive, but can you give a particular positive spin to one aspect? So we always end up with a optimistic feeling. So my most positive spin is, this is just, uh, in my opinion, about communication. And communication is an easy thing to fix. Um, and so I think, um, do I think that this is a shock like COVID? Is it a shock like the RMB devaluation scare? Absolutely not. So in the scheme of things, this is small. So nobody needs to panic. Okay, great. Let's leave it with this. Uh, nobody needs to panic uh, final sentence and thought. And uh, thanks again, Robin, for this wonderful talk. And uh, we stay in touch. Thanks and so much for having me. Good having you. Bye-bye.